Before the video begins, I'd like to apologize in advance for my voice. I'm a little sick at the moment, so I'm probably sounding a lot more nasally than usual. And with that out of the way, let's dive right in. Kevin and Donna Freeze married June 25th, 1988, and lived in Davenport, Iowa. Both were prominent members of their community and participated in a range of volunteer, non-profit charity organizations. Together, they had four children, and their youngest was an adopted son by the name of Sean. By 2016, their two eldest children had moved away from the family home and were well on their way to figuring out their own paths through life. As they embarked on this journey, they would keep in contact with their parents on a regular basis and had a very good relationship with them. The youngest, though, was not making the transition into adulthood as well as his siblings had been doing. 20-year-old Sean lived at home. He didn't have a job, and at the time was having trouble finishing his high school certificate, something that he had failed multiple times over. Neighbours who knew the Freeze family well would say that Sean was a standoffish sort of person. He didn't wish to participate in the many neighbourhood events that his family was involved in, and he spent much of his time indoors playing video games. There are reports of many arguments and conflicts that occurred between Sean and his parents. Some of these so intense, Sean could be heard from outside the house. He would raise his voice, punch walls, throw objects, and refused to follow house rules. Although tensions at times were high, Donna and Kevin are said to have been committed to supporting their young son, providing the man with structure and stability as he entered into his adult life. They attempted to do this by setting rules. Rules they believed that would assist him in the world when he one day left home. Some of these included things such as a limitation on how many video games he played. They wanted him to wake up early and not to sleep in till midday. They wanted him to prove that he could accomplish tasks before being rewarded. And they had a curfew for him to be home by 11.45pm. If he wasn't back at the house by this time, it was made clear that he would be locked out and have to sleep in his car. Donna and Kevin devoted a lot of their energy to helping their son learn how to be a productive member of society and would try many ways to connect with him. One such way was showing interest in things he liked. Sean was an avid gun lover, and despite not being very fond of guns themselves, his parents had purchased him an AR-15 rifle, a weapon that he claims is his favourite gun. When Sean would complete homework or achieve good results, his parents at times would reward him by taking him to a gun range to fire that weapon. His mother Donna even once tried to shoot it at the gun range herself, but she mentioned that she didn't like it at all. Although purchasing it for him, Donna really did not like this weapon, and there was a rule that it was to be kept locked away in a gun case that was located in Sean's vehicle. This gun was not to be stored in the house. The date is October 4th, 2016. Sean is hanging out with his girlfriend at his house, and it's starting to get late. Around 11pm, he leaves to take her home, and on the way back, decides to stop at a store to get a Mountain Dew. Because he does this, he doesn't make it back in time for the 11.45 curfew. Sean receives a text message from his mother at 11.57pm, and it's at this point that I'll read through the entire back and forth text message exchange that lasted around half an hour. The first message from Donna to Sean reads, You need to get home. At 12.03am, another text from his mum comes through saying, Doors are locked. At 12.07, Sean texts back and says, I'm here. Donna responds, You're late. Sean, Yeah, I know. I have schoolwork to do. Unlock the door, please. Donna, You are getting up in the morning and doing schoolwork. 12.10 a.m. now. Message from Sean. Mum, you have to realise that it's better to let me sleep in a little so I can be better rested. I'm staying up later so I can catch up on schoolwork. Donna, Dad and I talked today, and you will get up before Dad leaves and go to bed like normal people. No more staying up all night and sleeping until noon. Sean, I'm not going to bed at 9 when my curfew is 11.45. Donna, I didn't say you had to go to bed at 9 and you know it, you just like to argue. Sean, and getting me up that early will make me upset and not want to do anything. Can you please unlock the door? I would like to do my work. Donna, 
If you want to live here, you are going to keep normal hours. I'm tired of being sleep deprived, so you can do what you want, when you want. Sean. Unlock the door, please. Donna. You need to do what's asked of you, not what you want to. Sean. Unlock the door, please. Donna. If you are not up and working in the morning before I leave, I'm taking the internet and TV down every night. Sean. Then how will I do schoolwork? Donna. During the day. Go to bed. It's around this point in time, 12.25am, where Donna unlocks the door and lets Sean in. What occurs over the next few hours is not entirely known, but video security footage from a neighbor's house shows an unknown figure walk out of the Freeze residence at 3.40am. This person goes to Sean's car and unlocks it using a key fob. They take a long black object out of the back, which is then carried into the house. Around 3.55am, a neighbor is woken by the sound of gunshots coming from the Freeze house. She makes her way to the window to peer outside and sees all of the lights on at the Freeze residence and a figure is walking around on the inside. From this point up till about 4.18, there's a bit of commotion on the CCTV. The unknown person leaves the house and gets in the car a number of times, then back out. They bring the black object from the house back into the car and then they take it out and carry it into the house once more. This person then drives away using Sean's car for a few minutes, but then they return. They sit in the car for a couple of minutes, and then at 4.18am, they drive away, and eight minutes later, Sean is verified to have attended a nearby McDonald's in his car. He purchases a drink, then returns home at about 4.40am. It's at 4.46am that a 911 call is placed. 911, what's the address of the emergency? 1122 West 59th Street. And what's your name, sir? My, my name is Sean Freese. Sean, tell me exactly what happened. I, I uh, left my house to go on a drive like I usually do, and I went over to McDonald's on my way back and got a large drink, and I came home and... <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm <just> yes. <laughs> Let's go. Calm down, okay? What's going on there? I, I was I went inside my house <laughs> and I I, I I saw my gun just laying on the floor and I was and I I didn't leave it there. I left it in the case, leaning against the the wall in the corner, and I was <laughs> just. Sean. <laughs> Is there anybody in your house, Sean? No, I'm the only one in here. Okay. Well, so are you worried there's yeah. somebody inside? No, no. <laughs> I saw my gun laying on the ground, and the back door was partially open. I was wondering what was going on, so I went upstairs to see if my parents were still here. My dad's truck is still here. It's parked outside, <laughs> so I figured he was still here. I went upstairs. Both my parents are shot, and they're not breathing. Okay. <laughs> please, please hurry. Sean, just step outside. Okay. Where's the, the gun is still laying on the ground? The gun is still laying on the ground. I haven't touched it. Nothing. The back door is still partially okay. open. I haven't touched did you it. Say, did you say neither of them are breathing? Neither of them are breathing. My mom, okay. my mom's really pale. My dad's playing on the ground. Okay, okay, Sean. <laughs> Sean, I'm with you. Sean, where are you at right now? I went outside like you said. Sean, you said neither of them, you sure neither of them are breathing? <laughs> it was in that room. Okay, okay. Where you found the gun, was that in the room where you found your parents, Sean, or was that in a different room? <laughs> my, my gun is... Downstairs, my parents are upstairs. Okay. So the gun's downstairs, your parents are upstairs, and they've both been shot. Yes. Are they, Sean, are they in the same room? Yes. Okay. And there's nobody home? There's nobody home with you and them? Okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Take a deep breath for me, okay, Sean? <laughs> Do you have any idea who would have done this, Sean? I have no idea, but... My okay. parents are loving people. Okay. <laughs> how long were you, okay, how long were you gone from the house, Sean? I was gone for like an hour and a half. 
Thank you. I just got back. <laughs> Take a deep breath, honey. We have help headed your way, okay? Thank you. You're welcome. And you have no idea who would have done this to your parents. I have no idea who would do this. Okay. <laughs> I'm not going to hang up until they get there, okay? Okay. You still outside? Yes. I'm okay. About, I'm about to light a cigarette. Okay. And you're sure neither of them are breathing? Oh, I, I saw my mom. She literally looks dead. Like, and my dad, he's laying face down. And... <laughs> okay. Okay. You're almost there, Sean. Okay, they're getting closer. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> and you said you just went to you just went to McDonald's and then you came back and you just noticed that the back door was open and they were and they were gone. I, I, what, I left my house like an hour and a half ago. And I just went on a drive. I went up and down Wisconsin Avenue like I usually do, listening to music. It's very relaxing to me. And then I went to McDonald's, get up in the train. <laughs> I, I came home. <laughs> and you said the back door was partially open, is that correct? Yes. Who would do this? I don't know. They're going to, hopefully they'll figure it out, okay? <laughs> and you, you said you have, your parents haven't had a problem with anybody. What? You said your parents are loving people. Yes. Okay. <laughs> 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 Just, just the room on the right. Sean, I'm going to let you go if they're there, okay? Okay. Okay. They're going to take care of you, okay? Okay. Okay. Are you okay with me letting you go? Yes. Okay. Okay. I'm going to let you go. <laughs> Thank you. Law enforcement arrive on scene and find Sean sitting outside crying. They say he is barely responsive and so distressed that he can barely walk. He was even having trouble breathing. The officers enter the property and find the AR-15 gun next to an open gun case downstairs in the living area. When they make their way upstairs to the master bedroom, they find the bodies of Donna and Kevin, both riddled with bullet wounds. The two are deceased. The responding officer mentions that the scene was incredibly grisly blood splatter all over the wall and floor. And this, combined with the fact that he knew these people personally, it was very difficult for him to hold back his emotions, and he takes a moment to step outside for fresh air. When the detective arrives on scene, the first thing he notices is that all the lights in the house are on, there's no forced entry, and nothing seems to have been stolen or ransacked. This didn't look like a robbery at all. He says that burglars don't usually put any lights on in a house that they're in, so it was strange that the entire house was lit up like this. Sean is immediately suspected to have been involved in some way, and is taken to the police station for an interview, which begins at 7.25am. Before the detective enters the room and begins his questioning, Sean has a conversation with the officer who brought him to the station, and the detective watches on from another room. This interaction is said to have been rather strange, as Sean would bounce between conversational and emotional. The detective would say that out of all his years doing this, this did not seem like a man who had just lost his parents. Yeah, all right, I'll be right back. Take it easy, keep breathing, man. Thank you. What's, what's your name? Officer Digman. Oh, Dig? Man, yep, D-I-G on the end. Hey, hey. What kind of pistol is that? Because that's not a Glock. Mm -hmm. That's a Glock? Mm -hmm. I can't wait till I turn 21. I finally uh, get a yeah pistols and carry mm -hmm. permit, all that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the two things I love are video games and guns. 
and video games tonight. We're like, we're lovers. We're lovers, hands down. But my parents were always worried about me uh, becoming a violent person because of that. I'm not a violent person. I've never been in a fight before. Mm -hmm. Never. And I never want to be. I, mm -hmm. I stop violence. Mm -hmm. I just own three guns, uh, two shotguns, a uh, harder pump 12 gauge, uh, Remington 870, and uh, my other gun, the assault rifle that uh, did the damage, um, uh, DPMS Panther Oracle 16. I was so proud of myself when I bought that gun, and oh, the gun was so beautiful. My parents, uh, bought me some ammo and uh, took me out shooting uh, because I could take the class in a week. Oh, really? And then uh, they, were, they were proud of me, though. Anyways, yeah, um, I'm, I'm a pretty good shot. Yeah. As you heard, Sean mentions that his AR rifle was the one that, quote, did the damage. The detective finds this to be an odd thing for the young man to say, because even though that weapon was out of place in the living room, if Sean wasn't home, how would have he known what gun was used in the shooting? Furthermore, Sean's story so far has been that he went out for a drive around 2.30am and didn't come home till about 4.40. The detective knows at this point though, by looking at the neighbour's video surveillance cameras, that this is a lie, and he will eventually confront him on that. The detective enters the room, and the interrogation properly begins. Sean, yeah, uh, Detective Thomas from Denver Police Department, right? Uh, Yours? Are you working anywhere right now, Sean? I currently work for my parents' construction business. What kind of car do you drive? I drive a 2002 GMC Envoy. What color is it? One of the tricky colors. It's, it's in the red family. Who else has sets of keys to your car? Um, I have both sets. You have both sets. Yes. Nobody else drives your car. No. You have to tell the truth about everything, Sean. I know. The whole truth and nothing but the truth. I know. I wouldn't really say that we're arguing. Um, well, yeah, I, I guess we were arguing. Um, and uh, I agreed to her terms to lock the door. Okay, then what happens? And then I went inside. I go uh, straight into my game room and I do some schoolwork and I decide to take a break from that and get back on the game system. And my mom uh, walked in on me and uh, she thought that the entire time I was playing video games and I explained to her no I wasn't. So now this is the second time she told you to get to bed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Did she say get to bed, or is she a little bit angry with you? She was she was mad at first when she thought that I was playing video games the entire time, but she but she was a little more understanding uh, when I showed her the schoolwork that I had been doing. Okay. Um, but it was more like, uh, uh, well, get to bed, Sean. As the interrogation progresses, the detective puts pressure on Sean by questioning him about his reaction to finding the bodies of his parents. I was in complete shock, disbelief. I thought I was having a terrible, terrible nightmare. But then started to realize, like, oh shit, this is real. So I, I called 911 as fast as I possibly could. It's going to come out. I, I understand that. I did not kill him. What happened to him then? They got killed. They got shot. I didn't do it. I have no idea. I wasn't there. Then why did you lie to me about what time you were at the house? I didn't lie. I told you. I'm not good with time. Listen, I, if you think I'm lying, I want you to call me on it. Because I will prove to you that I'm telling the truth. I'll take you out and I'll show you the video. We'll walk out of this room and I will show you the video of you coming and going from the house at a time when you said you weren't there. I understand. Okay. If you want, want me to be honest, if I would do something like this, then I would have taken their money. I would have taken their cards, cards, their credit cards and all that, and I would have left town. Now my question to you is, you, you think that 
I killed them, and you think, well, I know you have me on camera leaving the house okay. multiple times. Do you have me on camera committing the crime? Uh, no. Well, alrighty then. Shortly after that exchange, Sean asks for an attorney, and the interrogation ends. The detective tells him to consider himself under arrest, and an investigation commences. There's a few details that the detective points out that he had noticed during the interrogation, and they are as follows. There was a fresh scratch that Sean had on his chest and his neck. He believes that Sean had likely had a struggle with his mother, seeing as she had blood under her nails. He opines that Sean had shot her first, and when his father rushed toward him to take the gun away, he burned his hands on the barrel and received gunshot wounds through one of his hands. It is also said by the detective that if it wasn't Sean who did this, and he was truly out driving somewhere like he says, that means an intruder would have had to enter the locked house without any signs of forced entry, turned all of the lights on in every room without alerting Kevin or Donna, they would have had to find Sean's gun, which was supposed to be in the car, unlock the case, load it, go upstairs, and shoot the couple in the bedroom where they slept. Then they would have had to flee the property without taking anything, not even a purse or a laptop, which were easily visible to anyone entering the property. Blood is found on Sean's shorts, and after testing, it is confirmed to be Kevin's. Sean's fingerprints are on the gun, the magazine and the scope, and overall, the interview conducted was said to be very out of the ordinary for a person in Sean's position. He didn't ask once how his parents are doing, were they actually dead, where were they shot, no mention of his parents' condition was said at all. It is said that Sean seemed to show more love and affection for his gun than his deceased parents. At one point, he's even seen bragging to the detective about how good he is at shooting at the gun range. Quote, I was popping them off at 700 meters like nothing. I love my guns. End quote. The same morning of that police interrogation, Sean is given the opportunity to make a phone call, and he contacts one of his friends. The call is being recorded, a fact that Sean was made aware of. But despite this, he confesses to his friend what actually happened, he being the one who indeed did shoot his parents. Dude. You didn't call or text me. What were you thinking, man? I wasn't thinking at all. We got in a huge argument and I snapped. Hey, what was the argument about? It was just them and the rules. <clears throat> Bending the rules? Yeah, them and their, their rules and everything they were putting me through. Like your curfew and all that, or? Um, that and just everything. They'd just been treating me poorly uh, last night and I just couldn't take it. What the f I know. I know. I f***ed up. Originally I was just going to take my own life and I couldn't do that. <clears throat> so then I thought, kill and get my gun and shoot them and then I'll shoot myself. And half of that worked out. Sean is charged with two counts of first-degree murder, and in November of 2017, he faces a jury trial. The state presents all of the evidence that you've heard over the course of this video so far, and a few other details. They argue that the killings were premeditated, and to prove first-degree murder, they only have to show that he had thought about a plan moments before the death. They didn't have to prove a big, elaborate, premeditated plan that goes back weeks and weeks. They say he took the time to obtain the weapon from his vehicle, to go back inside, load it, walk upstairs and pull the trigger. This is a plan that was thought out, thus this is first degree murder. Furthermore, after he had shot them, he tried to cover his traces. He didn't call 911 immediately either, like one would expect from someone coming out of a state of rage-induced confusion. He instead spent a while driving to McDonald's, ordering food and drinks, placing the weapon in different locations, coming and going from his house before the 911 call was ever made. Then, when the call finally did take place, he took almost two minutes before even mentioning that his parents had been shot. Throughout this call, they say he lied, tried to cover his tracks, and worked to construct an alibi for himself, saying he'd been out for an hour and a half. But at that point, he didn't realize that the neighbor's surveillance camera was capturing him. Unfortunately for Sean, 
the camera proves that it would have been absolutely impossible for him to be at the location that he said he was driving, based on the time he left the house. Also, if someone else did use his gun and retrieved it from the vehicle, how did they manage to do this, using the key fob? By his own words in the police interview, he was the only one who had possession of these keys. He had had enough of their rules, he had enough of the curfew, he made a plan, and he took action. Killing them was the very weapon and ammunition that they had used as incentive to him to finish his high school diploma. What am I going to do? I can't. My parents are mad at me. They won't let me play video games. They make me come in at midnight. They want me to get a job. I'm going to go out to my car. I am going to grab my AR-15. I'm going to load it. I'm going to carry it back in the house. I'm going to go upstairs where they're both in one room. And I'm going to point it at them. And I'm going to pull the trigger numerous times saying you snapped is not an excuse for carrying out your plan to kill somebody. The defense, on the other hand, would start out the trial by placing doubt on his involvement. They initially said that Sean cannot be visually identified as the person in that footage, nor can his car. They say that the fingerprints on the gun make sense that they're his. He was the only one handling this weapon. Just because his prints are on it, that doesn't prove anything. They say that there was blood under Donna's nails, and this blood was not tested. It could have belonged to someone who actually did the crime. Even though the defense eventually admit that Sean was the shooter, they highlight these details to try and prove a rushed investigation by the state, and that the burden of proof had not been met for first degree murder. They say that this should be a charge of manslaughter instead. By the defense's take on the evidence, there is a big unknown as to what happened between the hours of 12.30am and 3.50am. The final text message was sent around 1230 and then we know not what occurred in that house in the following hours. What they put forward is the idea that there were very heated arguments happening, and by his own admission, Sean snapped. He killed them in a fit of rage, and he intended to commit suicide as well. He wasn't thinking clearly, and this was not premeditated. There was no plan, just a crime of passion. He had scratches on his throat and chest, and all the lights on the house were on. They say something happened in there that hasn't been explained. They highlight that he's on camera crying multiple times, police body cam footage, car cameras, and the interrogation. He's emotional and can't walk. He needed to pull over when being driven to the station so that he could vomit. All of these, signs of someone who didn't realize what he was doing, and upon coming to terms with it, is an emotional wreck. They indicate that Sean actually had plans to move out of home soon with some of his friends and he was doing well and had been passing his classes. The rules that his parents put on him, rules that the state say were so oppressive it made him hate them, these rules weren't that intense at all. They were nothing more than slight inconveniences to him. They say the curfew was something that did bother him, and he would discuss this with his friends and girlfriend at times, but they all say that the time deadline to be home was something that got under his skin a little and nothing more. This isn't a man who wants his parents dead. This is a young man who actually has a future, and things were working out, and he snapped in the moment, not understanding fully what he was doing. To further support this idea, they bring up testimony from Sean's girlfriend at the time. She says that that day, there were no tensions between Sean and his parents at all. They were all having a laugh around the dinner table together, when his mother tried to get him to eat Brussels sprouts. Once again, the defense reiterates, this isn't the signs of a man who thought about killing, plotting and planning how to do it. It was a moment where he snapped, tried to kill himself, and ended up killing his parents. The jury deliberates for two and a half hours before finding Sean guilty on both counts. 21-year-old at the time Sean is sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. It's at this point of the video that I've moved away from court documents and research and now speak from my own thoughts and opinions on the case. The case has striking similarities to that of Chandler Halderson's Hay, of course without the intricate web of lies woven throughout that one, but it still does have the same framework. Loving parents who are prominent members of the community, they tried to provide their son with love and care, understanding, 
all whilst he failed his way through base level education, only to have him turn on them in the most horrible way. I do believe Sean snapped like he said he did. And if so, did he hold a baseline of resentment for his parents? Therefore, the snap saw him execute them and relieve that inattention. Or did the snap come as some sort of psychotic break, which saw him perform violent actions that he otherwise would have never wished to have done? This question saw me digging around for more information on his mental health. And through that search, I stumbled across a mental health evaluation performed on him after his arrest. I'll read through the parts that stood out to me now. Mr. Freeze was not neglected, abused, or exposed to domestic violence during his upbringing. He enjoyed a good home life with sufficient love and attention. In school, Mr. Freeze was bullied often, such that he became truant frequently. He performed poorly and so repeated a grade before dropping out after his 11th year. When arrested in the instant matter, he was taking online courses in an attempt to earn a high school diploma. Mr. Freeze had a driver's license and the use of a car provided by his parents. He tended not to independently shop or cook, but was able to do so. He cleaned his room from time to time. He was able to attend his own bodily needs. Mr. Freeze enjoyed video games, cleaning his guns, practice shooting, and getting high. He socialized with a few friends. He was dependent upon his parents for finances and room and board. Mr. Freeze had been arrested previously in March of 2016. He was charged with trespassing and carrying a weapon. He had a knife in a sheath on his waist. Before being jailed regarding his present charges, Mr. Freeze had consumed alcohol socially. He smoked marijuana rather prodigiously. Such often consisted of seven or more blunts of marijuana per day. He also smoked more than a pack of cigarettes per day. He underwent substance abuse treatment at some point in the past. He also received mental health care previously. Mr. Freeze complained of bothersome feelings of depression, anxiety in crowds, and occasional panic attacks. He also mentioned a fear of heights and difficulty trusting others. He denied marked irritability or bothersome feelings of guilt. He denied crying spells, mood swings, anhedonia, or withdrawal. Only occasionally he is aware of racing thoughts and energy fluctuations. Mr. Freeze denied lethal tendencies. In the past, he had attempted to end his life twice, once by overdosing and another time by hanging himself. He complained of sometimes feeling paranoid and thinking he sees ghosts. He has imagined his parents appearing in his cell, telling him that they miss him, that heaven is nice, and that he has a number of relatives there. Because of Mr. Freeze's frequent hesitations, as well as his complaint of some memory limitations, he was administered tests of memory malingering and psychotic symptom feigning. Mr. Freeze's performance on this measure was extremely poor. He earned a score of 13 correct on the first trial and 11 on the second. His performance was far below chance. Such can only occur if one is aware of the correct answers, but intentionally provides false ones. Mr. Freeze appeared to be feigning memory limitations. Mr. Freeze was then administered the MFAST, an MFAST score of 6 or above is highly suggestive of malingering psychopathology in both clinical and non-clinical samples. Mr. Freeze's score of 19 out of 25 items revealed strong evidence of false responding on all the malingering scales of this battery. Mr. Freeze appears to have attempted to present an excessive and erroneous picture of nominal psychotic symptoms. Mr. Freeze was additionally administered a standardized and empirically derived test of courtroom competence. His performance on this measure was quite poor. It is easier to do well on than the structured interview above, since it requires only recognition memory for most answers. It revealed the near certainty that Mr. Freeze was aware of the correct answers to give, but intentionally responded falsely. Recommendations it is recommended that Mr. Freeze be regarded as competent for trial. He does not appear to lack factual and rational understanding of courtroom participants and procedures, understanding of case events, or skills to assist defense counsel, despite his false representations to the contrary. I find it interesting that although the man hasn't constructed the same level of lies as Chandler Halderson did, he has more than proven that he is willing to adjust his story to suit his needs. 
He lied through the 911 call, the police interrogation, and now, as you can see, attempted to manipulate during his mental evaluation. There are reports that during the trial, he was laughing and smiling, turning around to his friends who sat right behind him, and he would pull faces at them. He joked around about how his parents were terrible at shooting guns, merely hours after he found them dead. The list goes on and on to indicate that this man, at the very least, does not experience emotions like the average person. His ability to disconnect from the reality that two lovely people were killed is truly on another level. And once again, it does draw my attention back to Chandler's police interrogation. Chandler jokingly laughed and said that his dad cut his arm on the fireplace glass, indicating that his dad's an idiot, when he knew full well that he had just killed and chopped the man up hours earlier. Sean here is on that same level. Is it psychopathy? Narcissistic personality disorder? Malingering? Sadism? Who knows what this man is? But what I do know is more than likely behind bars, away from the rest of society, is probably the correct place for him, hey? With that being said, I'd like to turn my attention to Kevin and Donna. I uncovered a lot of information about what sort of ways Donna and Kevin would engage with the world around them, and I must say, they sounded like pure saints. They both were active members and volunteers with the Chamber of Commerce and many other non-profit organisations, such as the Make-A-Wish Foundation, Marcha Dimes, King's Harvest Homeless Shelter, and the Festival of Trees. They would provide a space for the homeless to watch movies and would make popcorn for them to eat as they enjoyed the film. Both of them engaged in mission work for their church, helped the rural communities survive through the tough times via food donations, monetary support, clothing, furnishings and more. Kevin helped the Cub Scouts and would coach younger soccer teams, and Donna loved doing crafts, which would eventually lead to the creation of Hearts of Quad Cities, a service which provided beautiful decorations and event planning assistance to many non-profits and businesses of all sizes. 57-year-old Donna and 58-year-old Kevin had many friends, and I'll read through some quotes from them now. Quote, Their children, Corey and Ashley, asked me if I would do a celebration of life party for them, so I gathered all of our volunteers, people from the chamber and more, and we all came together. There was live music, dancing, drinks and food. Kevin and Donna would have liked that. I don't ever remember seeing Donna not smiling. Even in the bad times, she had a smile. Another friend says, Kevin and Donna were a hard-working couple who raised a family and devoted a lot to them. They devoted a lot to raising Sean and did a lot to try bring him into the adult world. But they paid for this with their lives. Their daughter Ashley says, I dream about my parents every night and I have to retell myself every morning that they're dead. The family I grew up with is gone. I think about it throughout every day, and it's one of my last thoughts before I go to bed. They were my everything, and now they're all gone. My whole world is flipped. Their son Corey would say, I struggle every day to adjust to life without mum and dad. There's an obvious void without them around. I used to spend a lot of time with them, and it's very hard to not be able to talk to them. And another one of their friends would say, They truly loved the community. Their impact on the community is immeasurable. I mean, I can't even tell you how many organisations the couple were involved with. Donna was on so many committees. I'm so impressed that they were able to do so much for others. They volunteered so much. They had several businesses, and yet they always gave their time. More than they ever needed to. That was what made them special. 